In today's video, I'm gonna share with you the five biggest mistakes that artists make when animating in Cinema 4D. Let's go. Hey everybody, it's Nick here from Grayscale Gorilla, bringing you the tools, training, and tutorials to help make you a better motion designer. Now, today's video was recorded during a live show when I talked about the five biggest mistakes that beginners make when they start to animate in Cinema 4D. Now, you're gonna wanna stay tuned if you've ever wanted to learn how to keyframe, we're gonna talk about how to get started and some of the mistakes that you might come across. Now, if you're not following us over on Twitch where we're doing these live shows, be sure sure to head on over there after watching this video and follow us there. We go live about once a week and we're there trying to answer your questions and help you become a better motion designer. So make sure you click the link below or right here on YouTube and hope to see you over there live. Okay, with that, let's head on into today's video. Well, hey, thanks again. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Nick Campbell from Grayscale Gorilla, and thanks for coming here and joining us today. I'm going to share with you the five biggest mistakes that new animators make when they start animating either in Cinema 4D, After Effects, no matter where you're animating, there always seems to be the same types of mistakes that beginners make. And listen, we all do it. I've done it. Um, I learned how, I started to learn how to animate, um, man, years ago. Let's just say that. It's been uh, around the year 2000, 2001. I started to learn what the heck a keyframe was. I actually learned first in Final Cut Pro, trying to animate fades and graphics, all that stuff way back in the day. And um, it took me many years to figure this stuff out. And what I wanted to do, and our goal always here at Grayscale Gorilla is to make all the mistakes and then share with you all the mistakes that we make so that you don't have to make them. And so what I wanted to share with you guys was the five biggest mistakes that new animators make. And so hopefully you can kind of just breeze right through that stage of your animation career and get to the stuff where it starts to look more like the things you see on TV, or it starts to look more like the things that you see in the movies or in a cartoon. Remember, animation is, you know, motion, motion graphics and animation is not just uh, about flying logos and making words spin around. These animation uh, principles come from a long history of animation. Um, cell frame by frame animation and flip books and all, these, all this traditional animation source does apply to motion design. So that's really a tip and we're gonna get into more tips later but I wanted to get straight into the five mistakes that anim new animators make. Now the first one is about timing. And um, I combine these together. They're kind of two mistakes at once, but let's go with the first part. So it's one point A, I'm already breaking this down. Uh, and that is the first mistake is going too slow, animating too slow. And this can be um, easy to do because many timelines kind of tell you how long your, your, your scene should be. So for example, when you open up an After Effects scene, um, it might give you 10 seconds of, of padding. And does that mean that your entire animation has to fill up that 10 seconds? It doesn't. And so for many beginner animators, they think they have to start here and end here. And, and as slow as it goes, that well, that's just what the computer wants. We're just gonna go slow. In Cinema 4D, they give you a three second timeline by default. And in many, many times, you might not need to take up that whole three seconds for this move. So what I want you to start to do is Think about your timing. Are you just setting a keyframe, moving somewhere in the future and setting a second keyframe and saying, well, that it's going from here to here. That's, it must be, you know, the, the computer's taking care of it. Um, that is one of the first mistakes. Now, a corollary of that, the, 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 same, uh, the same coin, but a different side is going too fast. Have you ever tried to animate a camera and then you set up all your camera moves and you put it everywhere. And then at the end of it, you're like, you, you do a little play blast or you do a quick render and you look at it and you go, that is way faster than, than I thought. Anybody have that? Like put yes in the, in the actual like thing. Cause I, I think that's a mistake we all do. And that, especially with camera movements, it also works with dynamics. And anytime that you're seeing a playback in your viewport and then you all of a sudden do a final render and you're like, oh my gosh, it's way faster, way faster. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, but sometimes it's just your keyframes are too dang close together. And this was really common in camera moves. I, I remember when I started to learn how to animate a camera, uh, what I would do is I could say, okay, the camera has to look at this word 
And then it's got to spin around and look at this word. And then it's got to fly up and look at this word. And then we're going to pan out and look at all the words at once. And I would kind of click through the timeline and set my four keyframes, do a little easy ease on it. And then I would play it back and I, and I would go like, well, it, it, it did what I wanted. It hit this word, it hit this word, it hit this word, it hit this word. But there's a lot of tricks that your brain can play when you go too fast like that. So, so why is that? So if you, if you set up your animations and you look at it and you're like, well, it hits all the words. So I guess I did it right. One thing to keep in mind about if, if you're animating too fast, one of the things that you're, one of the tricks your brain can play is that you're staring at this animation over and over and over again. And you already know what the words are that are on the screen. You typed them or you brought the logo in. So something you have to keep in mind is the viewer of this animation does not have all the knowledge that you do of these logos and what the words say. They need way longer than you do to read all the words, to see all the scenery. So it often with new animators, they'll fly through everything and they'll show it to a new person and they're like, or, or somebody that's never seen it before and they're like, I didn't, that, that just flew right by, I don't know anything. Um, so keep that in mind, animating too fast or animating too slow. It's a very, very common mistake and it, it comes with practice, but it also comes with studying how animation works and, and looking at some of your favorite work online and breaking down what that is. So that leads us to mistake number two. I need a little water after that one. I'm already excited. So mistake number two is not adding variation to your animation. Now it's similar, it may sound similar to the first one about fast and slow, but variation is about combining fast and slow to create a rhythm, to, tr to create a cadence, to create a dance, to create a motion. The human brain sees and experiences things based on contrast. If everything is moving all at once, then nothing is important and our brain says, just ignore this, it's just static on a screen. But if you control what you what eyeballs look at very carefully and understand how brains work, understand how visual senses work, you will start to animate in a in a different way. You're gonna start to understand that variation um, is going to provide the most attention to what you're trying to build because that's ultimately what you're trying to do with animation. You want people's attention to watch what you're watching and be emotionally involved in it, whether it's selling a product, making a short film, you it is your job to grab their, their eyeballs, bring it to the screen and keep their attention. And one of the best ways to do that is adding variation. Now think of variation in other arts um, and, and you could start to apply that to um, to animation itself. So for me, I was a musical, you know, I was into, I was into musicals, but I was also into music. I was a musical kid, right? So for me, variation was, you know, rhythm and drums and piano and staccato. And I loved that. I loved animating to music because it gave me that, that physical variation and it came through the music first and it allowed me to bring it to my animation. So there's gonna be a lot of hand waving in this one. I know it because I once I get excited, I start hand waving. But imagine an animation that is just like this. That's just one linear little move, right? Just the train's coming through, here it comes. And then of course you could do speed ups, right? You could do speed ups into slow downs. But now imagine that the animation is tied to music or tied to dance and tied to um, some sort of rhythmic way of, of expressing um, um, emotion. And now you're gonna get right? There's one way to do it. Or there's another way to do it. Right, that was another way to do it. So it's literally think of sounds or think of dance or think of things that aren't just keyframes. That's really what you're shooting for. You're shooting for attention, you're shooting for visual interest. And by adding slow and fast to your keyframes, you're really gonna add a lot of visual interest to your work. So let me know if that makes sense. I did a lot of, a lot of you know, there's gonna be more singing involved. Trust me, but let me know if that makes sense in the comments. And if you're watching later, I'd love to see a comment too if you're watching later on YouTube. We might put up this part just alone here. Okay, so 
Now the third one. Boom, we're on to number three already. Mm. The third biggest mistake is ignoring the principles of animation. And that is a very common mistake, especially in motion design, where they think that the principles of animation don't apply to them. Now, I had the same thought early on. I looked at all the animation books and they had cartoon characters on them. In fact, one of the best ones has a bunch of cartoons on them and then you open them up and it's full of more cartoon characters. And I go, I don't wanna learn how to animate cartoon characters, I just wanna learn how to animate. Like I wanna fling a logo around, I wanna do, you know, like fight club animations and I wanted to do TV commercial, like big, you know, explosions, cameras zooming out and all this stuff. I, I don't need to read this this cartoon book. Well, I did, I and I should have, I should have earlier. Because the principles of animation apply to all animation. And this is for many reasons. This, this gets back to how humans see and feel things. We have a built-in language in our head because we've grown up around cartoons. We've grown up around computer animation. We've grown up around 3D animation. And our brain um, knows what certain things are, right? Have you ever seen that you ever seen that test where they'll show a clip and they'll put like a happy piece of music behind it and it just looks like an innocuous like clip of somebody like turning around and smiling and then they play that same exact clip with a um, a spooky, you know, a scary piece of music and they have that same person turn around and smile and all of a sudden your brain connects, wow, this person is evil. Where before with the regular music, your brain never said this person was evil. These are the tricks, these are the, I keep saying tricks, but they're really, this is a language in our head that, that means certain things. And if you learn the language of animation and how to influence people um, visually and say, how do, you make, um, how do you make them expect that something's gonna come from the left? Right? That's a good way to, to, to pull interest to the left of the screen. How do you make people expect that this thing is gonna move in a certain way? And how do you break those rules too, right? If you, as soon as you learn the principles of animation, you're gonna start to see not cartoon characters, but all animation in a new way. So make sure you study the principles of animation. Number four. All right, so number four is uh, what I call letting the computer animate for you. Now, this is a very common mistake. I still make this mistake. Um, and, and it's all about not understanding what the art of keyframing is. If you look at keyframes and you just say, all right, the goal of keyframing is to go from here to here, or the goal of keyframing is to show this and show this and show this, and you think of it very mechanically, it's gonna look like a computer animated it. And that's because it is. The whole concept of keyframing is about uh, setting up the keyframes, and you could learn this by, uh, you, a lot of you I'm sure know this, but if you don't know the concept of keyframing, it originated with um, you know hand-drawn cartoons and hand-drawn animation where the keyframer would come in and set the, the key positions of the, the animation. And then the in-betweeners, which is where the word tween comes from, the in-betweeners would come in and animate the rest. So the, the animator would come in and say, here's Bugs Bunny with this hand up, two hands up, and then here's Bugs Bunny with one hand up. And then they would rely on the in-between animators to do each individual in-between animation. And now with computer animation, the in-between animation is done by the computer and not by um, the in-between artists. So what this means is you need to tell the computer how to go from here to here. And you need to do that with learning how to animate with curves, learning how the actual timeline works, learning how to um, learning how speed values and how overshoots and all the in intricate things that you could do to a, a piece of geometry or, or even a layer in After Effects to allow you to, um, again, bring that emotion and put it on the screen rather than let a computer decide how to go from here to here. You need to get in there and grab those keyframes and grab those curves and say, no, 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 computer. I appreciate the help, buddy, really do. But in this case, I'm gonna take control and I'm gonna tell the object how it's going from here to here. And in just a little bit, I'm gonna switch over to cinema and show you an exact version of that. I have a bunch of different things that are animating with all with different curves. I wanna show you the drastic difference. 
But before we do that, let's get on to number five. Number five, and this applies really specifically to Cinema 4D animation, and this is something I literally still do to this day, but it is a, um, it is a mistake and, and it can cause problems, especially when doing work for clients. And that is using Dynamics and MoGraph as an animation crutch for everything. Now listen, you've seen my tutorials. I'm as guilty as anybody. And you know why? That's because I am a great animator in After Effects, but I a lot of that knowledge I didn't bring over to Cinema 4D, and that's because the timeline was much different and much more complicated in Cinema 4D than it was in After Effects. So what did I do? I relied on Dynamics. What were all of my early tutorials, right? How to set up Dynamics, how to use that for animation, and then also MoGraph, how to set up you know, some uh, effectors and fall offs and do all that stuff. Now, Dynamics and MoGraph are super powerful. They can help you animate things you can never ever do by hand. But when your client or when you want a specific thing to happen in your scene, you it's really hard to rely on MoGraph and Dynamics. So even when we, started building animation tools like Transform and Signal, we still left in the ability for an animator to go in and tell what you exactly what you wanted to do. We wanted, when we make our plugins for animation, we want to follow these rules. We want to make it easier for you to follow these rules. And we make you know curves that look more realistic instead of just linear curves. We make, um, signal and give you the ability to still animate a curve from one place to another. Um, so even when we make software, we don't want to take control away from the animator because we know that in production that that is super important. So you've all probably run into the thing where you do a dynamic simulation and maybe you or the client or somebody goes that this looks great, but can we have this one thing fall in a different place and can it kind of land right side up instead of upside down? And you're like, well, we could like tweak the dynamics a little bit and rerun it and see if we could do it. But wouldn't it be great if you could actually know how things fell and bounced and rolled so that you can take that hero, uh, you know, pack of gum or whatever you're animating, let it fall to the floor and bounce just the right way, and then leave dynamics up to the rest of the simulation. But the one, the hero, the one that you wanna control is gonna be under your guidance. That comes up all the time, and it's something I'm super guilty of. And in fact, that's why we brought David Brodeur in when we wanted to do an animation course, I certainly wasn't the one to show you in After Effects. So we brought David in, he's a great animator for that reason. He knows all these principles, and of course, he's been doing this stuff for clients for years. So we'll get to that in a minute, but I wanted to get those five out there for you. Is any, do any of those ring true for anybody? And to recap for anybody out there, we have timing, going too fast or too slow. Um, these are the five mistakes, bad timing. Two, not enough variation in your keyframes. Three, um, not learning the core animation principles. Four, letting a computer animate for you instead of taking control. Five, using Dynamics or MoGraph as a crutch. So what, what, which one of those rings the most true for you guys? Uh, they've all hit me <laughs> at a certain point. I feel ya. Okay. So what I wanted to share with you guys are some ways to start to learn this stuff right now, um, like right away. So the first obvious one is to go study animation. Go study your favorite animation and learn what it is about that animation that drives you to it, that is interesting. How did they get you to look over there? How did they make the, the uh, camera move that way? Literally go study the things that you love and try to break them down, try to replicate the camera move, do all that stuff. And let me show you guys a book. Um, and it, this book right here is the one I mentioned earlier on. It's called The Animator's Survival Kit Book. Uh, or it's actually called The Animator's Survival Kit. I just wrote book just to remind myself. But I have a link here on Amazon. If you literally just search for The Animator's Survival Kit, you'll find it. And it's really amazing, highly recommended to anybody doing animation. You can get started there. 
So study animation, animator survival kit, and uh, of course, take a course, go learn this stuff. And one of the things I wanted to tell you guys about was David Brodeur's animation fundamentals course. We finally put it on our store and it's available now. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit different than if you've heard about it in the past. But the number one thing when we've had this class in the past people have asked us is, is there a, a more affordable option that you guys have for this class? And we figured out a way to reduce the price significantly for you guys, but keep the value up and, and still make it a really great course. So I'm gonna tell you more about that stuff. Um, uh, but if you wanna learn more about it, it's literally in our store right now. If you wanna get started learning animation, go check out Animation Fundamentals with David Brodeur. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that in just a second, but I wanted to hop into Cinema 4D and show you the actual difference between some of these keyframes. All right, and so let's let's just do that. Let's do that right now. Let's go to, oh yeah, we've got to switch it. Bam! Okay, now let me make sure we're good. Okay, here we are in Cinema 4D, and we have four cubes, and the thing I want you to pay attention to is the movement of these cubes. These four cubes go from over here on frame zero, and on frame 90, they're over here, right? So the thing I want you to remember is the start and end of both of these, of all of these animations are exactly the same. And the real difference between all four of these is gonna be how they move from left to right. So let's just start with a linear keyframe. And in this case, I did use signal just because it's really easy to tweak keyframes. Like I said, all of our animation plugins allow you to control the curves so that you have more control over your animation. Now, this is a really typical linear keyframe, and that just means that there's really no speed difference through this entire thing. It's just an ongoing train movement from left to right. And that's a you can see the curve right here going from zero to in this case, 1200 centimeters. So we're going from left to right, really. Now, because I'm streaming, there's a little bit of jumpiness, but let me let it cache here. There it goes. Real boring linear keyframe. Definitely something you want to avoid. Okay, the next step up is an easy ease style. Now, let me show you this curve. This curve is more of a default uh, inside of Cinema 4D. Also, After Effects has some eases that are good to get started with, but you can see it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit more human, right? We have a little bit of stopping and starting. It's speeding up and slowing down. This is kind of the next step up, right? Uh, the next one above that is what I call an exponential curve. Now, I use this one a lot in animation, and it's the ability to really get that get to get some speed going on. This is about this is about the variation. This is about uh, number two in our our common mistakes. This keyframe is still only two keyframes, by the way. It's one at the start, one at the end, but the the speed between it is drastically fast at the start and slow at the end. And that gives you a much more uh, visually interesting way to get from A to B. Now, custom, this uh, is a little bit of an experiment. I was playing around with a few of the things that you can do um, to get an object from point A to point B. Now, in this case, we have a little bit of anticipation where the object goes back, moves forward, and kind of settles into place. Now, this is very rudimentary. Uh, like I said, I am not as uh, prolific and, and uh, useful inside of cinema as an animator as I am inside of After Effects. And again, that's why we brought David in to, to do the course. He knows this stuff way more than I do, but I wanted to give you a sense of how much more intricate you can make this to go from point A to point B. And don't forget, that this is only on the X axis. We can have this object hop over. If you could see my mouse, or if I could add another cube, we can have an animation go like this. And now the, the start and end is exactly the same, but now we have variation in a height as well, and not just a train rolling through. So this is really, really rudimentary way to show this, but look at all four of these cubes are essentially, you know, if you look at them in a keyframe way, they're all, they all have the same start and end keyframes, but the way that they're getting from A to B is drastically, drastically different. And these are the things you need to start to learn inside of After Effects, inside of Cinema 4D to be able to, again, control what you're trying to do. So 
What's another thing that you could do to start to learn this stuff? Well, you know, you know, I've said this a lot. I would like you tonight or tomorrow. In fact, it's getting into the weekend. If you guys are interested in animation, I want you to grab one camera move or one animation move that is, um, that is a part of an animation that you really, really enjoy. Something moving across the screen or a camera. And I want you to try to replicate it exactly. And I want you to try to replicate it exactly with the least amount of keyframes, right? So anybody could just go from frame to frame to frame and match it bit by bit by bit. But you're gonna learn how to make curves. You're gonna learn how to animate properly if you could do it with the least amount of keyframes. So try that challenge. Literally just grab a camera move, something really beautiful that you really respond to, bring it in and try to match yours to theirs. It, does, it could be a gray render, it doesn't have to be anything, but the movement itself and the timing, try to get that going. That is a huge way that, that you can start to learn animation. Um, now, I'm gonna get in here, I'm gonna do some Q&A with you guys as well, but before we do that, I wanted to show you guys uh, what this latest animation fundamentals is. So let me head on over to the, to the website here. And if you guys are interested in this stuff, if you guys listen to all that and you're you know, ready to start animating more inside of Cinema 4D, if you're ready to start taking control, start learning traditional animation techniques, we built this course specifically for this reason. For animators that are like, all right, I know how to make it look shiny. I know how to make it look good. I know I'm starting to learn lighting. I'm starting to learn all these things. But every time I animate a camera or every time I uh, try to make something that looks like it's on, uh, should be on TV, it just, you know, it's a little jerky and it's, there's a little extra movements and all this stuff that can happen. So let me, let me switch over and just share because I want to answer a few questions that people have had about this new course. Now, this is Animation Fundamentals. It's taught by David Brodeur. He's been doing this stuff for huge clients for years. He's an amazing uh, creative director, and he's also a really good teacher, just like everybody that we bring over here at Grayscale Gorilla and, and to be a part of our crew. You, you gotta be good at what you do, but man, you have to be a good teacher. And David's one of the best, especially at teaching animation. And Animation Fundamentals is all about teaching you the traditional animation principles inside of Cinema 4D so that you can apply them directly. Now, if you're not familiar with David, you've I know you've seen his work over at Locked and Loading. He's responsible for all these gross out, awesome animations on Instagram lately. And I think he might still be in the chat. So thank you if you are, David, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, it's about learning the Cinema 4D timeline and learning about things like this, how to make a really simple graphic that has good camera animation, has good follow through, and is uh, entertaining to the eyeballs. That's what it's about. We have a whole Q&A section, but the biggest Q&A, or the biggest Q that we get is all about um, how is this different from the course that we've offered before? And the course that we offered before had a live show that we, that you could join us once a week, um, and it also had some live critique uh, from David. And so both of those things made it a, a lot more um, expensive to be a part of. It was a little bit more one-on-one -on -one when it came to uh, helping out with the students. But this course is all the same exact video content. It's all the same training from David. Um, but we just stopped doing the live shows. We stopped doing the uh, critique. And instead, we built a Slack channel to allow everybody that is a part of the course to be a part of a private Slack channel where you guys can critique each other. And then sometimes uh, people from Grayscale Gorilla come into that Slack channel, give critique and kind of help you guys out. So we found that not only having the students in the Slack channel, but having alumni that have taken the class in the past in the channel has been really, really helpful. You also get access to all of the recordings of the live shows where David did critique um, some of the students work. So we find a lot of the mistakes happen the, the same to everybody. A lot of people make the same mistakes. And so we've broken down all the live shows and all the critiques to correspond with the entire series. So if you're stuck somewhere, you can watch one of these live critiques um, that was recorded before, and I think you'll get a lot out of that. So all of this allows us to um, 
uh, offer this at a much lower price. It's much more affordable. Uh, and it, it just literally came out yesterday and it's out for 227. And again, you get all the videos right away over nine hours of video of, of David teaching you animation fundamentals, but you also get, um, uh, over 30 hours of recorded critique and live shows over the last couple years where David did those live shows as well. So it's huge value. Please go check it out over Animation Fundamentals Training. Uh, we could put a link here on Twitch. Does that work? I don't know. How does Twitch work? Let's see. Boom. Does that work? Yeah, it works. Hey, thank you guys so much for checking this out. Uh, thanks for checking out the animation principles. And we're going to jump into a uh, Q&A as well. And um, so get your questions ready. If you have any questions about the training, about animation, about something that you're stuck with, you know, let me know. I'm always glad to help. That's what we're about here at Grayscale Gorilla, about helping the motion designer do their best work. So uh, let's go. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for uh, staying. And uh, we also have some alumni as well in the chat. So they could also uh, chime in, let you know what they thought of the course. We have plenty of quotes and stuff from previous um, uh, you know, users of the course and animators, but uh, just a huge response for this course from everybody that's taken it. And again, if now's not the right time, we totally understand, um, but keep it in mind when you're ready to you know, really like speed up your animation training. Um, and if, you know, if you're not ready for it quite yet, don't forget some of the things I mentioned earlier to really start to kickstart those things. Some of the books, some of the things you could start right now. Thanks again for watching everybody. And don't forget we're doing more live shows over on our Twitch channel and right here on YouTube. So make sure you're following us on both channels and we hope to see you in another video really soon. Bye everybody. I've been singing Smashing Pumpkins all day. I have no idea why. Today is the game. That's pitch, pitch perfect right there.